Hello, Witch Enthusiasts! Now, today I'd like to speak about the best releases at this turn of the month, because at this point we're coming into March, and of course this is the month of Baselworld, so there will be a vast number of releases in about a month's time, just under that, in fact. And so today I'd like to speak ab about a number of pieces which have been interesting over the past month, and which have been released which I think mark interesting directions for brands, and also which offer interesting redesigns of existing models. Now, I will point out that there have been some very high-end pieces from Vacheron Stantin and Breguet released this month, as well as some uh, some pieces from Ulysse Nardin, but I'm trying to stick to some watches which are, are more accessible and perhaps uh, simply more relevant um, to the vast majority of people, and certainly I can't afford the sorts of uh, platinum dress watches I sometimes talk about. And so with such a rich, diverse range of, of affordable pieces released this month, I think why not speak about these pieces instead? Now, the first piece I'd like to speak about is a new and rather curious limited edition from Swatch, and I get the feeling this piece, which is the Swatch Fly Magic, is designed to be more of a showcase of the future for the Swatch group, rather than a, a production model in terms of a large-scale production in the long run. Because this piece is a, a rather polarising design, which as you can see is, is quite striking really, and I'll, I'll talk, you talk you through that sort of design in a bit. But the key component of this watch is the movement. And this piece is a 1500 Swiss franc watch, and so one has to bear that in mind, and is, is limited edition of 500 pieces in each colour. And this piece is a stainless steel watch, uh, which either comes in normal uh, stainless steel or a uh, gold-coloured PVD, and comes with a size of 45mm by 14.8mm thick, and so it's no small watch. Now the two key headlines with this piece are the back-to-front mounted movement, and also the fact that this watch has a new material for its balance spring. Now starting with the first of those two, the movement inside this watch is quite visibly uh, a relative, a very close relative, of the movement in the very popular Swatch System 51. And of course the price difference between these two watches is, is enormous, but the System 51's movement has shown a very new direction for automatic movements, in the sense of being a, a fully mechanically made movement, and by that I mean that uh, no human hands are involved in the manufacturing of it. And the System 51 movement is an impressive example of a brand as large as the Swatch Group being able to take movements and uh, bring them back to their most basic needs, having a long power reserve, a, a decent reliability, and design which is, is cost-effective at these sort of price ranges, and they really have made a, a pretty marvellous movement out of it. Of course, it doesn't have the serviceability of a conventional movement, which is a complaint for me, but certainly I think the way they've worked with these movements, especially now that it's been remodified for the Fly Magic, is very interesting. And what they've done here is they've flipped the movement over. So what you can see on the, the dial side of the watch is in fact the side which would normally automatically wind the watch, and so you can see the balance wheel, um, as well as the, the various other components you would normally see on the back of the watch, including some of the gear train. And so here you can see the fact that uh, the, the dial is skeletonized, and you can actually see a transparent rotor which rotates around the front of the dial side and automatically winds the watch. Another quirk of this wrong way up movement is the fact that, uh, irrespective of which way round a movement goes, the wheels are still going to turn in the same direction, so the seconds on this watch actually turn the wrong way, which I think is rather a curious touch and, and quite amusing in the context of this watch. But the most important thing about this watch, I think, in terms of the Swatch Group, is this is the first watch to be fitted with their new Nivacron springs. And these springs are designed to be the next rung down from silicon. And this is why I find the price of this watch a tad confusing, because this is designed to be a less expensive alternative to silicon hair springs. Now, these springs have already been used in some Tissot watches, which cost less than this timepiece, which does somewhat muddy the waters, but certainly being the first of its type, and also bearing in mind the fact that this watch is a piece which, uh, which is limited edition, really does justify the fact that uh, they would bump up the price. And the interesting thing is that this provides a spring which is, is non-magnetic, because it's titanium-based, it's a titanium alloy, rather than having a, um, a steel alloy, which, uh, which Nivorox, for example, is, which is the standard for the industry. And so this marks a new direction for the Swatch Group, as they intend for all their watches to include um, silicon or, uh, or Nivacron springs in future. But aside from all of that, the movement provides 90 hours of power reserve running at 3 hertz with 19 joules. And so it's a, um, a, a certainly very long power reserve for a watch of this type, with that slightly lower beat rate. And with its rather mad limited edition styling, I think this piece is something really for a collector. Um, certainly it's not a standard watch, and certainly not something I would recommend to someone to buy as a watch just to be owned every day in a collection, unless you're really into this timepiece, which I think is, is inevitable, bearing in mind the fact there are better finished movements of higher quality being produced for far, far less within the Swatch Group, which um, which I think is something you just have to look at the Hamilton catalogue, for example, to, to notice. So certainly this is a piece for the collector, but I think it was an interesting one to speak about anyway, bearing in mind the fact that it does mark the beginning of Nivacron. 
The second piece I'd like to speak about is a model which has been long awaited, really, amongst uh, amongst sci-fi lovers and uh, amongst people in general who, who enjoyed the presence of Hamilton in the film Interstellar. And this is a watch which, really, I, I can't help but feel should have been released a few years ago, but it's great to see it join the Hamilton range at this point. Because this is the Hamilton Khaki Field Murph, and it's the watch which is fairly instrumental in the, the success of the film, if one looks at the plot, in terms of being a piece which is... Uh, it is used through the use of Morse code in the second hand to convey um, messages through space and time. So really it plays a pretty large role in the film, and certainly if you haven't seen Interstellar, I'd suggest you watch it before I tell you um, uh, tell, tell you anything more regarding uh, it, its role in the film, considering the fact that this watch is, um, is rather key to the, the play out of the film. And this watch wasn't on sale for a long period of time, it was simply a piece produced for the film, and so wasn't publicly available. But this version is now publicly available in both limited edition and non-limited edition forms, which I think is a, an appreciated move for Hamilton, because it does mean that the large numbers of people who do want these watches can still get hold of them, bearing in mind the only difference between the limited edition and the normal one is the box. And I do appreciate the fact that Hamilton haven't made this watch branded with the film name on its, uh, it, it, its most visible areas, and I think this is key to making the watch more interesting from the perspective of a collector. And so the watch is 42mm in diameter in stainless steel with 100m water resistance, which is pretty much ideal to be a field watch, bearing in mind the fact that this watch already comes from the khaki field line. And I think for even someone who hasn't seen the film and simply wants a vintage-inspired field watch, this is a fantastic choice. One then has cathedral hands with this brushed metal surface, which are also filled with aged luminova to give you a very bright display in the dark, and a style of dial in black, which is 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 not far from the, the military dials one sees on some older watches. Then one has a polished style of bezel, which works very well to break up the form which is normally brushed, and one has a protruding, unguarded crown. And the only touch which has been changed on this watch very visibly is the fact that there's a small addition to the second hand. And this, I feel, is a really attractive touch, because if you read the, 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 the marks that run down the second hand in lacquer, one can read out Eureka in Morse code, which again was uh, an exclamation both from Archimedes but also from the film um, upon realising that the Morse code was being shown on the watch, which I think is an attractive touch, bearing in mind the second hand was what denoted that in the film. So I, I do appreciate this touch and it certainly makes me smile. And beating inside this watch and visible through the exhibition case pack is the Hamilton Calibre H10. And the H10 is one of the swatch group's many offshoots of the ETA 2824, as is seen in the Powermatic 80 movements produced in some, uh, in some swatch group models for Tissot, as well as those, uh, those, those System 51 movements that I just spoke about. Except this movement is, is very heavily built and is produced extremely well in terms of being a, a genuine alternative to an ETA 2824, and it loses a bit of beat rate, so it no longer runs at 4Hz, but now runs at 3Hz, which means slightly more stutter in the second hand, which is in fairness very little concern. It's automatic winding, hacking in hand winding, but the really key component and uh, crucial factor is that it has an 80-hour power reserve, making it a much more convenient watch for someone who wants to take off their watch and leave it sitting around for a couple of days and be able to put it on and still have it running. And so I think for £835, this watch is a, a really fantastic buy if, you're, if you enjoyed the film and if you're looking for a sort of field watch with something a, bit, a little bit more. And the watch also does come in a limited edition of 2,550 pieces, which, uh, which comes with a, a particular box, which also simulates part of the film and part of the set design. This next piece I'd like to speak about is a somewhat divisive set of three new watches in the new range from Bremont. And Bremont is a brand which is uh, somewhat um, varied in terms of reception. Some people dislike them, some people like them a great deal, and so it's interesting to speak about them because they do show some interesting products, although I do have some reservations about this new release in terms of, um, of the style of the product and the, the way in which they've branded it. Now this is the Bremont Armed Forces collection, it's a collection of three watches which, um, which fill a, a field, a pilot's watch, and a, a dive watch style in this, uh, this collection of three. And these watches are, uh, are, are something which is somewhat different, because they're the only brand which is able to use Armed Forces branding and, um, and their logos in a sort of a licensing contract. And I should note that none of these watches are actual military watches, which really is the bit which I find somewhat disingenuous. All of these watches also move away from the Bremont standard of having their triptych cases, and instead go to a more standard two-piece case just for this range. But aside from that, I'll speak about each watch individually, and I'll be curious to hear what you have to say about these pieces in the comments down below. The first watch of this trio is the Broadsword, 
And this piece is a sort of a spiritual successor to the Dirty Dozen watches of the 1930s and 40s, which were produced for the Ministry of Defence when they really didn't have any watches produced in the UK, and so needed to, to have watches uh, shipped in from the continent, which were produced to a high enough standard to be able to, to work as military equipment. And so this watch is 40mm in diameter and in stainless steel, with a matte black dial with sunken seconds, with that, um, that sunburst sort of sun ray effect to it, which is quite subtle, and black painted hands with luminova in this sort of mint green sort of colour. And this style will be very recognisable to someone who collects military watches, although there is still a Bremont touch to it with the, those, those lugs with that wraparound polished bevel, which is very much of this brand. The detailing on the dial also is very much of that uh, 1940s style with the small seconds, although they have added the date to this watch, in addition to adding Her, Majesty, Her Majesty's armed forces to the dial, as well as the various seals of the Minister of Defence on the back. And this watch does mark the, the, the most sort of field watch-like piece in the collection with 100 meter watch resistance. And it comes on this khaki green strap, which I think fits the theme of the watch very well. And the movement inside it is the B952AV, which is based on ETA architecture, runs at 4 hertz, has a 38 hour power reserve, and is a 31 joule automatic, which is chronometer certified. And the price for this piece is £2,595. And whilst the broadsword was, uh, was related very closely to the, the military, in the form of, of the army, this next piece, the Argonaut, is, is related to the, the navy. And this piece has a name which, again, is inspired by the sea, and bearing in mind its Greek origins and, um, and its connotations, has been used in the navy for a long time as a, a ship name. And this is a 42mm stainless steel 300m diver, with those double crowns, with the, the top crown being to operate the movement, and the bottom crown the internal bezel. And the design of this watch is very different to any sort of dive watch that one sees from the, uh, the Navy, in terms of actually being used by divers, such as, for example, Omega Seamasters, some CWC watches, and of course the, the mill subs from Rolex. And this piece has a matte black dial as well, with similar branding with Bremont and HMAF, and does show the chronometer 300 meters on the dial as well. And I think it's a very simple design in terms of its, its appearance, but certainly will be an appealing one for someone who enjoys super compressor style dive watches, and does retain the same Bremont touches on the lugs with that brushed bezel as well. The movement inside this watch is another evolution of an ETA architecture, with 42 hours of power reserve running at 4 hertz, 25 joules, and of course with automatic winding, which is chronometer certified. It does have a few modifications, such as the addition of a, a Niverflex mainspring, an Anacron balance spring, and, um, and a Glycodur balance, it also has a, a customised rotor for the automatic winding as well, and the price for this watch is £2,795. And finally, the most expensive of the three is the Arrow, which is a 42mm watch, which is a pilot's monopusher chronograph, which, uh, which also features the same stainless steel case, but enlarged this, this time in terms of thickness to accommodate um, the, the extra movement, if you will. And it has a very similar dial as well um, to the, the broad broadsword, in terms of having that matte black dial with those chronograph subdials and this time a much larger central second and of course, for the chronograph. The date's been moved to 6 o'clock, and I think this is a very elegant watch in terms of its design, and certainly works well from a visual perspective. And the finishing on Bremont's is always very good, which I think does reinforce the value of these watches um, in terms of their, their function. And this watch has 100 meter towards resistance, as well as the, um, the, the use of a, a dial which is simple but highly legible and effective, which I think fits the bill for what this watch wants to achieve. And beating inside this watch is the calibre BE51AE, which is a 13 and a quarter line movement, and, um, and which provides this chronograph function for this watch, and is a modified uh, automatic, running at 4 hertz with 27 joules and a 48 hour power reserve. It's also chronometer certified, as per the other models in the range, and also features the same um, spring modifications as are seen in, uh, in the Argonaut. And I think for three and a half thousand pounds, or three thousand five hundred ninety-five to be exact, it does offer a very uh, complete package in terms of these features with that monopusher chronograph. And I don't think these watches are particularly overpriced, although certainly they do compete against difficult opposition, such as the the Argonaut, which I think is in a difficult position at twenty-eight hundred pounds when the Tudor Black Bay, which does undeniably have higher specifications in terms of features, is a little bit less. I think it's it's a difficult position to be balanced. But I think the, ba the, the balance of value isn't actually bad here, in terms of the quality of the product, and the general finishing that one's come to expect from Bremont. For me, the real problem with these watches is that they don't actually have any military connection. Whilst these watches do proclaim to, to celebrate the, the MOD, I can't help but feel that they're somewhat disingenuous, because these aren't military watches, they're watches which have been licensed by the military to, to be made with their branding and their logos, but at no point are these watches going to be used in combat, 
which I, I can't help but feel somewhat damages their, uh, their, their, their sort of image as watches of the military. But I'll be curious to hear what you have to say in the comments down below, because it is a, a point which is very much a, a, an ideological point rather than one which relates to the quality of the product, so I'll be curious what, to hear what you have to say. The next watches come in a collection of Grand Seikos which provide a very new direction for the brand and I think something interesting and very novel which I look forward to seeing develop in the future. And this is the Grand Seiko Elegance line, a range of 39mm by 11.6mm manually wound dress watches which provide a, a somewhat more svelte and, um, and somewhat more dressy option for those who love Grand Seiko but want something even more refined than what they currently produce. Now these watches come in uh, in, in gold, in uh, yellow gold, for the non-limited edition version, whilst there are three limited run versions, two in rose gold and one in steel. And certainly I have no doubt that Grand Seiko will expand the range in future, so I really would just view this as the preliminary offering from this, uh, this range, or the sort of first toe in the water, if you will. The interesting thing about the case of this watch is that it doesn't take on the usual ultra-slim form for an elegant dress watch, and I think this watch is far more of an everyday dress watch than anywhere near the sort of ultra-slim, special occasion sort of watch, which I think will play to this watch's advantage. And it has a three atmosphere water resistance, so really it's splash-proof, with this uh, case which is very much of Grand Seiko with these long curves, but the lugs are narrower and are, are closer to the case, which I think does make the whole watch appear more rounded and much more soft. The crown also remains large, but of course bearing in mind the fact that this watch is manually wound, I doubt anyone will complain about that. And then under that beautifully domed crystal, one has this, the execution which one can come to expect from Grand Seiko, with these phenomenally sharp hands, finished really fantastically beautifully, with brushing down their centre and polished edges, which appear almost like knife blades. And these watches use lacquered dials, and so these sit underneath beautifully sharply executed applied markers, as well as the small seconds on the left and the power reserve on the right. And they use this uh, this, this lacquered surface, which is, is derived from a, a type of oak tree in Japan, um, which is applied to the surface of the dial. And some special treatments have been given to these dials in the case of the steel version with the anthracite or Payne's grey sort of coloured dial, and then also the, the golden bronze sort of coloured dial on the one rose gold version. Because these have had the, uh, the, the, the powders of respective coloured metals added to the lacquer. And so on the steel version one sees silver added to it, which gives this fantastic colour, but also these forms to the surface of the dial, with the same uh, same sort of treatment done to the, the golden style dial as well, to give this fantastic appearance of something which really is a conversation starter. Of course, as always with Grand Seiko, one sees this fantastic combination of tradition in the case of the way the hands have been polished, the case has been polished, and of course that lacquered dial, with, uh, with absolute modernity. And the movement inside this watch is the 9S63, which is a small second power reserve indicator movement with a 72 hour power reserve and a manually wound form, so it's much slimmer than an automatic movement. This runs at 4 hertz and has 33 joules, so it has a very smooth run to the seconds, and this I think provides really the ideal movement for these watches, with the necessary sophistication of being manually wound and quite slender, with the addition of those dial mounted complications to just give a little bit more to the watch. Also, I think a lot of people will appreciate that they're mounted across that, that central axis of the dial, rather than being put in sort of strange positions, as we've come to expect from Grand Seiko. These do also have full decoration, which you can see through the exhibition case back, so there is the Grand Seiko logo emblazoned on the, the glass, which is a slight annoyance from my perspective, as I think a, an unimpeded view might have been better, but I can understand why they've done it to keep that a traditional addition of the Grand Seiko medallion in the centre of the case back. And the price of these watches is certainly high, with the three versions, the steel and the two rose gold versions, being limited editions of 1,500 pieces. And the price for the, the rose gold versions is €31,400, the steel version is 7400 and the standard gold version is 20700 So certainly they are high prices, but I think for the quality of the watch, these pieces really are quite, uh, quite incredible. And I think the addition of more stainless steel versions to the range will be welcome, especially in non-limited forms, which may perhaps be a little bit less expensive as well. And this final piece I'd like to speak about is a really fantastic model from Oxon Unia. And this is a brand which I have an enormous amount of respect for. They're a brand which produces watches which are utterly unique on the market, and in fact are one of the few brands where you can say there are no influences other than their own design to these watches, which I think is wonderful and really should be nurtured in the industry. And this piece I'd like to speak about today is their new two time zones plus date. And it's really something which explains exactly what it does in the name. It's a watch which takes their traditional case design with this very strong curvature to it, 
and very strong circular influence with these short jutting lugs and makes it into something very practical for daily use. And to start with the basics of this absolutely wonderful creation, one has a 42mm by 12.5mm thick case which is titanium or sterling silver. Now the titanium version is probably the, going to be the most bought one because it's a very practical choice and this piece provides you with two options, either bare titanium or PVD titanium, both of which will give you a very uh, dark appearance to the case and I think give a, a somewhat colder look to the watch than you would get if you used steel, for example, which I think is interesting and contributes to the design of this watch very well. And what I love about the way these watches are presented is there is very little branding on them, which means there's a certain sense of anonymity to them, but also a certain sense of being something which is more of an insider's um, watch, in the sense that someone who doesn't know about this brand may simply dismiss it as being any other watch without really paying much attention. And whilst this watch does take a, uh, a very dressy sort of form, it is still water resistant to 100 meters, which I think is, is very appealing and helpful. And the dial has this unique display, because as you can see, it's a very clean sort of appearance, but a very functional one at that. Now, the first thing to note are the hands. And in the center of the dial, one has the minutes and the hours. And these are read in the conventional way to be able to see your, your current time zone. Then one has the seconds at six o'clock, which are found on that very small ring, which rotate around um, once every minute, as is normal for a second hand, and allow you to have a small seconds display, which isn't obtrusive to the rest of the dial, whilst it's matched at the top of the dial by the power reserve indicator in the same format. Then one comes to the second time zone, which is displayed through the use of that large opening in the centre of the hour hand. And by turning the crown the opposite direction to the date change direction, you're able to rotate that central disc, and thus be able to move that second time zone, which is, is viewed through the aperture in the hour hand, as a sort of viewing window to be able to tell the time, which is a very innovative way of doing it, and something very clean and very interesting, whilst the date is shown in that very characteristic way of the brand, in each of those small apertures around the edge of the dial, in that snail sort of form, which gives a very clean look, and allows you to not actually have any numbers in that area of the dial, to give a very clean and very attractive aesthetic. And one beauty to these watches, which I think should be pointed out, is the fact that these watches are entirely customizable. So via the, the website of this brand, or indeed simply contacting them, you're able to customize the watch to your specifications with the dial color, the hands, and various other parameters which, uh, which allow you to really personalize the watch in a way which most brands simply don't offer. And the movement which powers this watch is the Ulysse Nardin UN 1018, which is modified by Oxen Unia to be able to, to have these additional functionalities. So it has a 60 hour power reserve and runs at 4 hertz, although frankly the 4 hertz are, are pretty much lost on this watch on the basis that you can't really see the seconds ticking, but either way they do contribute to the accuracy of this timepiece. And this really is a luxurious movement, it really is a step up from what you would see in the ETA sort of realms, or the Sleeta sort of realms. And rightly so, because this watch does start at 8,330 Swiss francs, but even so I think that this is very much a, a luxury watch and which is carried off incredibly well. Also, with 50 jewels, it really is no, no standard movement, and the decoration on the movement is impressive too. And so, all in all, I think this is a thoroughly delightful watch, and a really interesting way to end this video. And so I will conclude the video here, but do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of the video, and also what you thought on the various watches I included. Also, do follow me on Instagram, at uh, Arm on the Watch Guy to be able to see more horological content, my various video intros, and any sort of um, details or, or anything I come across which, which I happen to put up there, just to broaden your experience of the channel in general. And so if you did enjoy the video, then do please like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and also to be able to see more videos and content here in future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Arm on the Watch Guy, out.